Yeah. So today I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Benedikt Ehinger from the University of Stuttgart in Germany. Um, Benedikt has received his PhD in Cognitive Science from the University of Osnabrück in 2018 and then worked as a postdoctoral researcher with Floris de Lange in the Predictive Brain Lab at the Donners Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior, the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, in 2020, Benedikt received a tenure track professorship for computational cognitive science at the Stuttgart Center for Simulation Science um, and the Institute for Visualization and Detective Systems, where he has been teaching and conducting research for the past three years. And besides these occupations, Benedict has found the time to program, document, and maintain a fantastic toolbox for advanced EEG data analysis with linear deconvolution and regression ERPs. And the theory and practice of these methods as implemented in Benedict's Unfold Toolbox is the main topic of his talk here today. So Benedict, we are happy to have you here as a speaker and we are super excited to hear about how to unfold our ERPs now. Yeah, thanks a lot for the very nice uh, uh, warm welcome. And uh, let's set this up. So you should see my slides and the only thing missing is that I need to... Uh, from, oh, uh, no. uh, I wanted to have the chat as well, just in case. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So let's get started. Um, I'm now in Stuttgart. It's a lot of fun. I have a small lab and uh, we're continuing uh, on all these kind of developments that Jona just mentioned. And uh, but first of all, I want to start with the motivation of and just let's figure out together why you should potentially care about what I'm talking about in this uh, methods talk. Right. I first will introduce the concept of temporal overlap. Right. So a little bit of theory. And I will have a marker here because I like to point on things. Let's imagine you have a very simple experiment. You show houses, you show faces, and you just ask subject to press one button if it's a house, press another button if it's a face. Right? It may be a little bit simplistic, but similar paradigms exist. Like a lot of these paradigms exist. But so what happens if you record EG? So the EG is what I mostly deal with, but it, it will generalize to other uh, modalities as well, like pupil, fMRI or so. It's a little bit your homework to think about. Uh, how this um, affects your personal uh, favorites uh, modality uh, to record brain activity. So if you if you think of this, then you will get a response here to the stimulus onset, let's say a house, you will get a response to a face, uh, you get responses to each of the button presses as well. We, we all know this. What's underlying, in, a little bit underlying in your brain, um, here's a dangerous hidden assumption is here in here, but what you can think of is that you have an activity to a house and then you have activity to a button press, you have activity to face, you have activity to a button press. So what, basically what I'm saying here is you will have overlapping um, potentials. So all we have overlapping res brain responses, they overlap in time, right? You can see here. And uh, now this is of course a little bit dangerous because uh, maybe for houses, you are a little bit slower uh, to response than you are for faces, right? So then this overlap, of the even though everything could be the same, but the overlap could just introduce some kind of spurious effects between the conditions. For instance, here is a simple simulation. Um, here, zero onset of the uh, event face or house. One of these two lines is yeah, yellow is house, right? You can see that you get this late difference here, and this late difference is solely that's uh, unknowns to you. The reaction time for I don't know faces is probably shorter than the reaction time to houses. So you have different overlap. And also your button press doesn't really look like the original one that you simulated because here in the beginning and also in the end, you have a little bit of stimulus activity still in there. If you do a naive, like kind of event related uh, potential thing. Okay, so that's that's a theory that's all nice and good, but maybe this doesn't even mix or maybe this doesn't happen in the real world. So I give you two examples where this actually matters um, uh, quite a bit. So one is from uh, Annalisa Gerd. It all um, we recently published. Um, it's a fixation um, related uh, potential. So we measure eye tracking and EEG at the same time. And people look around in these kind of uh, images, which has faces and non-face uh, objects in, uh, in there. And what we are doing typically would do is that we are time locking um, our EEG signal and averaging to the uh, fixation onset. So zero here is fixation onset. So you have like one second after the fixation onset. And we can split it up. 
um, by whether people looking at faces or other. And then you, now you can look at this and say, okay, cool. N170, that's exactly what we would expect for faces. And then, oh, we have a little bit later one. Okay, maybe there are later effects um, uh, of face processing that we haven't seen before. But there's also this early one, and oh, that's very interesting. Maybe this is like the peripheral preview effect. You see a face in the periphery, and then you can already activate your face um, uh, um, uh, uh, sources, basically, as your face patches um, and the likes. But it turns out that if you run now this uh, deconvolution modeling, that this effect completely goes away. So this is really nice. So this is without unfold, with unfold. So now you have the uh, we are taking care of the overlap effect. And as you can see here, this is completely gone. And the reason what you're actually seeing here is uh, not even that that multiple eye movements are overlapping with each other, which they are, or that the, the acti brain activity of the eye movements are overlapping. But in this case, it's actually the stimulus activity that is overlapping with the eye movements. And it turns out that you first look at all the faces in an image. So you will have in the face, you have much more stimulus overlap than in the other and the non-face. Right. And afterwards, it just looks it looks nearly too good to be true. But it's I think it's it's just wonderful. And we had some simulations that showed exactly the same thing prior to seeing the data. So I, I was very happy as a, like an uh, empirical proof. But now um, uh, this is cool because we couldn't really do this kind of experiments before. We had to do some not so good steps to in order to look at this. But uh, now recently, together with um, with uh, Romy Frömer. Uh, we yeah we, we found something rather astonishing and uh, it's all it's now uh, published as a, as a preprint. So uh, um, Rom is interested in this kind of decision making experiments. Hey, will you choose? Uh, do you like the one stimulus or the other stimulus better? In this case, I, I think it's which one do you prefer to buy or something like this? Or maybe not buy, but uh, in general this. And what people have been observing here, um, so this is uh, Pizzao 2016 or something like this. That you you get this kind of like um, uh, increasing evidence integration kind of uh, uh, measures up to a certain point, and then you do your zero here as a button press, right? And um, if you have a fast run button press, then uh, yeah, you're going to integrate faster than if you have a slow button press, and you uh, um, in, uh, you integrate slower. That's kind of the idea. Now, Rumi uh, um, looked at this, and then she had a little bit weird results because the reaction times for her, the button press was very very uh, much further out, and so she uh, she had the the thought of hey maybe this is uh, let's simulate a little bit of data maybe this is also overlap and indeed if we run this through unfold uh, this effect completely goes away so this is the original data of uh, Pisao and we are now showing it I think in three other data sets as well where we can completely get rid of all this evidence integration um, uh, markers so if you're interested in that just check out this preprint sorry I should have put the DOI but I didn't. Um, yeah, but this like to summarize this like these are two very extremely different uh, experimental uh, paradigms where it's super important to take care of this uh, temporal overlap, um, I think. And uh, maybe one further application is uh, that that I also like. Can I activate? How do I activate now this video? Oh, it's not. Why is the video not running? Ah, anyway. So we have this uh, um, this this nice data set. This is together. Ah, now we can show you. This is uh, again work from uh, Annalisa Gerd from in, in Osnabrück. We have this nice data set where we are re recording EG and um, eye movements at the same time in in completely we call it wild environments. Uh, so completely outside any experimental control. And then of course you don't have only eye movements, but you have uh, lots and lots and lots of different events. And uh, one idea. Maybe a little bit naive idea, but so far it's working out uh, quite okay. It's just to model all of the events at the same time, right? Just think your brain is like a input output system. It's just a filter and that every event comes in, activates something and uh, goes out again. And this is something that uh, where you could use unfold. Just to summarize all of this, if you use, if you think about this kind of overlap and you're, you're uh, accepting for a moment that you can actually model this in, in some situation, this allows you to have real lots of benefits. Like you can look at multimodal um, experimental paradigms in a different light. Uh, whenever you do VR, you have eye movements. There's always so many things happening at the same time. Reading, of course, without eye movements, possible, but not very well. Uh, mobile EG, or maybe even uh, like getting infants or kids to look at the dot is really difficult. So if you have, if if you can, if this all works out in the end, we don't know, um, and it's applicable to many situations, that would be really great because we can check 
all of these uh, kind of uh, things and have new experiments, new questions to answer. Yeah. That's kind of the, the idea. So I hope you are now all motivated and you all understood that why you should listen to how we are actually going to do this overlap correction because that's going to be the next section, right? Okay, so a little bit of theory to overlap correction. The overlap correction is like one, like I motivated that there will be a second part on nonlinear effects, which I didn't haven't motivated so far, but the story is pretty similar. Let's get there when we get there. Okay, so you have this kind of epoch data, right? Five time points here, because I don't have a slide for 500 time points. Um, and what you typically would do or could do is you select one of these time points relative to an event. Let's say zero could be the onset of the stimulus or so. And what you can then do is run a linear model. So for those of you, I hope everybody's kind of familiar and I'm showing it anyway. Uh, we have some kind of design matrix that describes um, uh, what your experimental uh, events uh, look like. Then you have the data, of course, and here you can see we do one time point, right? We select one time point and we have lots of different trials because we cut the data to the uh, events. You have the design matrix and you try to find out how much should I weight this design matrix to get a good um, representation of, of what's going on in this year on, on average. And you do this by minimizing the error. So that's just a technicality. What you do this, you move this over. So you repeat it for each time point in your epoch. And then you get this kind of parameter estimates here for the different uh, effects. And maybe you are already familiar. You have, will have typically have intercepts and then you have uh, like effects of uh, categorical effect, let's say looking at a house or a face. And maybe you also have slopes. So slopes means uh, uh, like in a linear regression, we are in the regression framework after all. It just means uh, how strong an effect is. For instance, if you have luminance as uh, one of the predictor, it would mean how much a change in luminance by 1% or uh, however you code it. Uh, will affect the underlying EG, the underlying epoch. Okay, so there's no overlap correction up to this point. This is more or less the, exactly the same thing that you also do in, uh, uh, the, yeah, that's called mass univariate regressions. Not the same. No, okay. Put it like that. I don't want to detour too much. Okay. Now, if we go one step back to this uh, to this image that we had before with this uh, overlapping EG, right? We have here the overlapping EG. And we really think of what is the relation of this overlapping ERP and this underlying uh, um, isolated event response, right? If, if I take one of these samples here, then I could see, okay, this is actually the sum of this and the sum of this. And they, like here, the sum of this and the sum of this, and they have different distance here to the, uh, the actual events that they occur. So this is this one here is a late response to this phase here, and this one here is like an early response, right? Whoops, it's early, like after 100 milliseconds, and maybe this one here is only after 300 milliseconds, right? Uh, okay, that's that's not really quite interesting. So uh, this one here is a sum of two data points, but that are have different relation to the underlying event. Now, if I can take maybe the same point here somewhere later, so this is the same distance here, then I get a different sum. Of these of these three points here with the different distance to the events, right? And that's really the key to understand. Like, because we know when the events happen in an experiment, and we know that each of this distance here or to an event um, has a has a different uh, um, composition and the underlying uh, unknown uh, responses. We can try to, uh, we, we kind of have already the information, we just need to get it out again to find a, a good way to just describe this here, or like or to find this actual responses so that we can get this, but also have all the linear uh, summing constraints that I just introduced here. So how does this work? So again, now we have the e, uh, EG here on the uh, y-axis, and this is a little bit of false friend because on the slide previous, I showed you here also EG data, but there it was like different trials. Now here it's actually continuous EG, right? So this is different samples. So be able, you have to be careful here. We are uh, mixing a little bit, uh, all of it. But now we can introduce this concept of that each sample is actually the sum, um, the, the, the sum to uh, events, like the response at different times. For instance here, if, if this uh, uh, event happens exactly at that uh, time point sample, I could put a one uh, here because it's like one sample distance or at the first uh, distance to that event. And then there's another orange one here. And if I count one, two, three, four, should be five or uh, at least four before. So I have to put a one here um, as well. So now the sample is the sum of uh, response to that uh, event. 
short in time and the response to the event long in time. And in addition, because there's a blue event here, maybe I also have to put in uh, the blue uh, one as well. If I now move to the next sample, it would look a little bit uh, different. So I have now, this is now the response to an event shifted in time by one. Here also shift in time by one, but because our analysis window is only five long, we just drop this one. But this one here, now we can go back one, two, three, four. So it's also going to be here at the five uh, one, and we can fill in the whole thing and we get this kind of staircase pattern. If you're familiar with the fMRI analysis, this is exactly what an FIR fMRI analysis uh, does, and it would be have been much faster but less fun to just uh, state that uh, in in the beginning. Okay, you have the, the you, and once you have this, you do the same uh, uh, thing that you had did before. You generate the sign matrix based on your sign. Then you have your data. You fit each channel separately. You fit this model, and you get the responses out. Now this is going to be a very long vector here. Um, because you're fitting all your ERPs at, uh, basically at the same time. Um, a fun fact, or two fun facts maybe, if you run this model on data that doesn't actually have any overlapping uh, events, so how would that look like? That means that, that uh, these, there will be, never be a row where there are two ones here of the same event uh, in the same thing. If you run exactly uh, on overlap-free um, designs, you will get exactly the same thing as in the mass universe. It's just computationally much more expensive. So. Uh, it will take longer to fit, but uh, but that that's that's quite nice. And the second thing I already forgot, but maybe I will remember it later. Okay. So this is the theory for uh, how can we do overlap correction. And then there's a little bit of theory of uh, nonlinear effects. So what is a nonlinear effect? Well, anything that's nonlinear. Haha. <laughs> Let's imagine you have like a, a the predictor value for saccade amplitude because I like eye movements, right? Saccade amplitude is the size of an eye movement. And this is a signal to be explained, could be like the P100 response, or it could be some kind of bold response or pupil or whatever. This underlying um, scatter plot, this is the actual relation with little noise. I wish I had data with such little noise. And this is what typically people, if they think of uh, adding a saccade amplitude predictor, they would just fit in a line, right? And they would say, okay, I assume that this is a linear predictor and all is good. But you can clearly see, and we will have here, uh, you're assuming that this, the signal is too, too high and here it's too low, and so it just doesn't fit this, uh, um, uh, this line uh, at all. But then people in the next step, typically, what they came up with, they say, oh, okay, damn, it's actually not linear. I need to do something else. Uh, what they're typically doing is that uh, let's just break it down. One to two degrees visual angle will be one predictor. Two to three degrees will be second predictor. Three to four will be the fourth, etc. Right? So they they're categorizing basically this thing uh, um, in the simplest way, dichotomizing. So just having low and high saccade amplitudes, but that's just the more a little bit more general thing. And you can think of it as you are applying a, a set of basis function, and one of the basis functions, like this blue one here, it's zero everywhere except where you want to have the uh, your bin. Let's say four to five degrees here. There's one. And then uh, you go in here. You're estimating the betas again, and then you will get this nice staircase pattern, which is approximating the function a little bit nicer. But we are still a little bit weirded out because we, in nature we very rarely have this kind of steps, right? There's the natural signals are smooth; they don't have this this kind of step. Maybe one thing I put the sum here, and this will help you understand the, the next slide that's going to pop up in a second, um, because you can think of it also as you're taking this basis uh, function set. It's like a design matrix in some sense times the betas, and this is what this gives you the sum. So here, it's a little bit boring because all the other basis functions are zero, so you're not actually summing much. You could just take that one thing, but in the next slide, it's, it's more important. Okay, so I mentioned that this staircase pattern is a little bit unnatural. So one relatively simple thought is to maybe let's have a little bit of overlap between the neighboring bins. And alone with this overlap, you will get very super smooth uh, thing, and that's exactly what what we are uh, what we are proposing in our tools, the unfold toolbox that that uh, Yuna also uh, already mentioned. I think um, we are we are proposing, or what people are doing in uh, uh, generalized additive modeling (GAMS), um, they are basically replacing this with a spline basis. So now you can see that neighboring. Uh, we don't have this strict bins anymore, but there's an overlap with the neighboring thing, and that enforces some kind of smoothness, right? And now you have to actually take the sum uh, of this thing, and I will show you in a second on the next slide um, how this will work, because uh, yeah, this should also be in like a little bit of a lecture explanation kind of talk, like I try to make a little bit of a mix. 
so I, uh, I spend a little bit more time on this because I think it's 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 quite nice. So um, oh, there it is. Too many monitors. I have to switch my what I'm showing. So at some point I implemented this kind of interactive visualization, and you, uh, I'm just going to show the plots and talk about it. But you can of course also read all of the all of the all of the text um, as well. So you should now be able. Oh, you should be able to see my screen here, right? So it's a very similar thing that we had before. Here you have some data points, um, and you can check it out later. I put the slide on the, in the, uh, the, the URL in the slides. Uh, you have some data points, and you have some underlying, let's say, I don't know, sinus, or let's let's stay with the with the, the square, right? And we have 50 samples. We could do more, or we can have less samples, right? And we can also scale how much noise there is or not. Okay, but let's stick with the basic example for for now. So if we are doing a spline set, basically, we are we are tiling up the space by this kind of basis functions that I showed you in the previous slide. And you can now select you can have less uh, splines or you can have more splines. And already here, I input in, I I put in what is the what is this the ultimate outcome of it. But I can show it in a little bit nicer way because. Each of this basis function is now weighted by a parameter that you estimate from your data, and that looks something like this. So now you can really appreciate better that each of these points here is like the sum of all these functions that are that are that are that are going on here. And you can do the same for, for like trying to estimate the sinusoid here. But for me, that's the main point is that that you understand that this is always weight. Like you take the, this function here, it's already weighted by the beta here, and just add all of this, and this gives you the black. The black core, um, and maybe like once you understood that, then going one like this parameter here gets really interesting in, in terms of hey, uh, how many splines should I actually select, right? And that's that's a very tricky thing. If you do uh, not enough splines, right, from sinus, you can't model the sinus. If you if you have too many, well, at some point it breaks really breaks down. But if you have too many, like you get a total overfit. So this parameter setting this parameter right is a, is a hard problem and actually for this kind of eg analysis it's an unresolved problem right now i have some ideas how to do it uh, i just need like a week or two time uh, to, to only do that and then uh, maybe we have a next step but uh, typically you need some kind of regularization to do that properly and then for right now we are just saying oh let's just use four or five splines um, better to underfit than overfit and yeah just try it out. Uh, you can play around with this uh, if you want. If you have, of course, more data points, you can support more, com maybe more complex uh, splines uh, properly. Like if you have just five data points, it will very quickly look super, super weird, and you can just catch up all with all the data points perfectly yourself. Okay. Uh, can I just switch here back? And you no here. Can you see it now? No, that didn't work. Okay, back to the presentation. However, I do that. Yeah. Um, no, this is not the presentation. We will also discuss about this, but much later. You can already be excited here. Yeah, I wanted to share this monitor. Okay, cool. Um, just a very short uh, example how this looks in real life. So again, we have some kind of free viewing experiment because again, I like eye movements in, in EG. And now here zero again is the fixation onset. This is a, an occipital sensor here. And we have saccade amplitude as a, one of our predictor. And you can see that this uh, P100, this first peak here, um, this has a, a nonlinear relation because the distance here is five degrees. It's again five degrees, again five degrees, but here it barely makes any difference to go from 10 degrees uh, um, amplitude of your eye movements to 50 degrees, but here it's a huge difference, right? Interestingly enough, a little bit later, this is a linear effect actually here, it seems to be quite linear. And you can of course look at this in many different uh, ways. And you can also have like, once you're in the non-linear land, you can also have even circular um, effects. And that's uh, actually something that from time to time I see people want to do, like they want to look at, uh, at some kind of phase um, effect or like here in this case, circuit angle, so in which direction are you looking in your um, circuit? So all this, this kind of things is possible. So that's very cool. Um, and that's kind of like, that's kind of like where I'm, I'm stopping with this, um, the ex explaining too much, a little bit more in the end. And I will talk a little bit more about the actual research I'm currently doing. So this is uh, research with Rene Skoukis uh, in, in my lab. Um, 
he's also here so hi Rene and uh yeah the the question is a little bit of is overlap all you need uh, right so we have overlap uh, we have here like a p300 experiment and you have to press whether it's a target or not the target and we have the same thing that 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 we had before and the question the, the problem that we we, we realize uh, is that not only is overlap different but of course your brain is also doing something different you have different reaction times right and you like why do we all assume that a fast reaction time trial is actually the same as a slow reaction time trial and we are not all assuming this sorry uh, but all commonly we are just ignoring this right uh, but the brain should do something different and now you have a problem that uh, you would want to model this uh, reaction time effect let's say as a nonlinear effect and just put reaction time in but you would also want to model the overlap at the same time and we don't even know they, they kind of live from the same variability in the data so we don't really know if this is even possible to do or whether this is even something sensible to do so what we set out is was a, a pretty uh, elaborate uh, simulation study turns out so we had like different uh, event kernels and different relationships of the uh, of our reaction time effect here like so the blue would be short reactions and the yellow would be long reaction times and we had we came up with uh, uh, in this case three different um, kernels so basis functions we put them together for to a long overlapping uh, eg a continuous eg signal same eg we of course this is what we want to estimate so we are we are summing it so this is our eg data and because like this it would be super trivial to do probably we are just adding a lot a lot a lot of noise uh, onto it to make our life hard and now the question is can we recover basically these kind of shapes here and i'm i'm making a, a long story a little bit short uh, maybe but um, i'm going to present you the results and i'm going to present you how well we are doing so we are basically just estimating the responses and we're checking how well do they fit the, the our original responses that we use for simulation so that's the, the really cool bit about simulation studies you know what's true and I'm representing it like this. So this is like normalized mean squared error. So if you're above one, then this means uh, that you're probably doing a bad job, uh, including this kind of uh, modeling thing into your analysis. If you're in the green area here, then you are you should actually include this kind of uh, uh, effect. Uh, this kind of reaction time effect. And we are modeling reaction time as a linear, as a categorical, as uh, something with 10 splines and something with five splines. And the idea is here linear. This is what some people already came up with. Categorical is like the intuitive next step, as I discussed in a, a previous section. Ten and five splines is just to see a little bit of uh, how bad is this effect of over overfit if you're using too many splines. And then here I have several icons, like we have overlapping signals, we have non-overlapping signals, we have no duration simulated and duration uh, duration effect actually simulated. And then we're still working on the icons, but let's see how well it works. Okay, a little bit of warm up. We have non-overlapping simulated, non-overlapping data with no duration effect. And we just want to see, hey, if we are actually including, trying to fit an uh, reaction time effect um, without any overlap correction, just a reaction time effect, how worse is our overfit? Like, because we we know that there's a, this should be worse because we're not actually modeling anything in the data that can be captured by here. And you can see it's kind of okay. Uh, like we're a little bit more noisy. This is to be assumed we're fitting more parameters, but it's not so bad. Already, if we include uh, overlap, it gets a little bit more noisy, right? So especially with the ten splines here, you can remember ten splines. Uh, yeah, we we take a hit in our uh, SNR in some sense um, to fit it. And now, of course, the most interesting bit is <clears throat> if we are modeling overlap and we have a reaction time effect, how well? um uh, can can we recover it and with what functionality should we recover it and so pretty much for all of our shapes i'm just showing the results for one of the shapes here uh, we see the same pattern that the splines are actually working much nicer and much better than uh, um, than than not modeling so this is all remember one is just fitting a single erp to it without any duration effect and here we are including direction time effect and then the splines i think they it's very convincing that this this works pretty well. Zero would be uh, having perfect recovery. That should not be expected with our noise regime. So how does this look in practice? In practice, uh, we're looking at, uh, at the P300. I introduced that example already. And we noticed that that data set that we found, and I'm very happy to look at other data sets, it's actually surprisingly hard to find the data set we can actually use to look at this because we need to have, it's, we can't use PCI things, we need actual button presses, we need to know how fast does the brain react in, in some sense. We notice that the targets, you have a longer reaction time to targets than to distractors. Alarm, alarm, this is this covariate imbalance or the, like the, the overlap in, uh, um, problem that we, that we uh, were discussing very much in the beginning. 
So we looked at it in a in the classical fashion. So we just said no overlap correction here. We have to strike the target, and we see this P three hundred all beautiful here. I have uh, uh, not I when I say I here in this case Rene plotted the differences. Um, uh, curve as well. So now let's add the overlap correction and add direction time control. And what we can see that the P300 in this data set, I don't want to make two large uh, claims, but this was a little bit of this reaction here, that uh, uh, the P300 is gone. Right? Uh, that's uh, yeah. That's not the whole story because the P300 still exists if you look at the response log uh, uh, ERPs. And where we can't model uh, in this data set, we can't model reaction time for both the stimulus and the response at the same time. So it's not really clear yet. Uh, we don't have enough data to really figure out what happens. And yeah, it's it's a it's a bold claim that the P300 is a um, uh, result of reaction time differences. We're not the first to make it. In theory, people have been making it. Um, oh, I forgot the name. Oh, I'm very sorry. But 2015 is, I think, was uh, it's a paper. But yeah, uh, that would be extremely interesting, extremely um, uh, fun thing to show. Yeah, we have now new data, but we haven't analyzed it fully um, to, to really uh, bolden or weaken our claims here. Okay. Um, further in the current projects. So when I started out writing these toolboxes, uh, we had this big decision. Should we do it in MATLAB or should we do it in Python? Python was coming up. It was 2015. Python was really coming up um, and becoming much more popular. But then we also know our... Uh, a little bit more familiar with MATLAB, and 80% uh, of people back then used MATLAB for EG analysis. Okay, let's keep it in MATLAB. But now I, uh, I transitioned more or less completely to Julia, <laughs> and so I skipped uh, Python for, for it, and I re-implemented practically the whole toolbox, and I will talk about it in a second. But I want to motivate a little bit why it's a worthwhile thing to change uh, to Julia, and I don't, I will never, like, I don't want to go back uh, to MATLAB, and I don't want to I use lots of R, I use lots of Python, but I really like uh, Julia. It's just such an elegant and nice language. It just, just works so nice for all the science stuff that we do. So first of all, compared to MATLAB, Julia is much more cheaper. It's free. So that's already nice. It's uh, already nice if you want to host something somewhere and you don't need to bother with any licenses. If you want to run simulation code on an a high performance computer uh, creator, so you don't need care about any parallel computing licenses or whatever. So this is nice. Python also has it, of course. R has it as well. Um, the nice thing about Julia is the syntax is super easy. Uh, it's uh, an, a very nice mix between R, MATLAB, and Python, but without any of the baggage of uh, being a language from the 80s or 90s. But it has been started in 2010 or something, I think, and the 1.0 was released in 2018. So it's a super young language. <coughs> And it learned a lot about these other languages, right? Super important for science. It has inbuilt reproducible package management. For instance, I sent uh, uh, Yona before we we discussed some kind of simulation, and I could just send him my uh, my script, and he will have uh, he can instantiate exactly the same package versions uh, that I have, and I don't didn't have to send him any requirement.txt that doesn't work or conda yamls or, or something like that. It's just all thought of in the language. So that's for science. I think this is this is uh, really cool and really huge. Yeah, um, maybe the primary motivation for most people is uh, um, most developers of, of software is that it's easy to make fast code. So here, this is just some kind of OD, uh, uh, ordinary differential e uh, equation here. Just comparisons of different speci uh, specific solvers that try to sp solve this specific problem in some sense. And Julia just like it's, it's, it's miles away for, for this kind of things. I could show you other benchmarks in, um, yeah, it completely outperforms Python and R in, um, in most, mostly anything. It's uh, typically on par with Fortran and C, like that it's outperforming Fortran and C is, is rare. It's really hard to do that. Uh, you can probably always write some kind of specific C code that's faster, but uh, that's also not the, the point. The point is that you can write such fast code. If you run to write fast code in Python, you're not actually implementing it in Python at all. You're implementing it in C. Or in R, it's the same, in C++, right? On MATLAB, you have the max files, right? It's always the same. You always have to switch. And then everybody has to learn multiple languages. And it's a huge mess. Right? What I also didn't like in, in Python is that you always write np.add, np.mult, or whatever. Um, linear algebra is just natively implement, thought with in Julia, so I didn't like it. OK. <laughs> As a scientist, I also like uh, Greek symbols for some reasons. Uh, I think if you use them long enough, at some point you don't think so hard about them anymore. 
So you can put any Unicode and Latich characters, so that's very nice. Sometimes you have a, a paper and the code and the, the like the code in the paper, uh, the, the, the algorithm in the paper and the code, they pretty much look identical, so that's very nice. But there's, of course, <clears throat> also negative sides, right? One is that um, the startup time of Julia, uh, it needs to compile a lot of things before it started. So the first time you run a script, um, it will take quite a long time. So it can be that you would just want to do a quick analysis and then you just need to wait a minute until Julia starts up. And that's super annoying. Um, a minute doesn't sound like much, but it is super annoying and I, I really hate it. And uh, it's one of the main reasons I would ever switch uh, language again. The second time you run it, it, it goes like snap in one millisecond, but first time it might run, take 10 seconds and I'm not a patient uh, person. And so this is really annoying to me. And that's also what annoys most people, but it's getting better. Um, in newer Julia versions, they're really working hard on this. And now in the last version to 1.8 to 1.9, they cut it by a factor of 10 in, in, in many packages. So some development there. And <clears throat> of course, the package environment is much smaller, right? Python probably uh, has just huge ecosystem. R has a huge ecosystem, right? The good news is there are really nice packages called Python call and R call, where you can like just write Python code and then it immediately in Julia, like the, the variables, they don't even need to be copied or you can use the same um, uh, memory banks and, and this kind of thing. So switching between these two is, is actually uh, relatively easy. You can even use matplotlib, like if you uh, prefer that in, in Julia and all these kind of things. So wrapping, like accessing other languages is very nice and easy. And now, sorry. And now we also transitioned on FoldJL and it has several really nice new capabilities. Like we have super cool plotting functions now and they make a lot of sense. And we have, um, we have linear mixed models, which I hope to talk a little bit, uh, but I, I'm running a bit of time. I took too much time to explain things. You can have many more custom bases. Like you could even mix uh, uh, FIR with spline bases, all these kind of, this is more export level things. You can have time windows per events, longer or smaller time windows for each e different event or so. And you have a very nice interface to um, uh, this effects package <coughs> that will make your interpreting your data much easier. And we also started to put up a nice ecosystem in Julia to make simulations easy, to make plotting, like Maki is a plotting, plotting library, to make plotting library uh, easy, to make a bits uh, based analysis easier. And also Julia allows you to do really fancy things in terms of interaction, uh, interactivities, like this kind of shiny apps. Uh, it's like a little bit shiny on steroids. It's just like fast, shiny in some sense. But that's super cool. I'm looking very much forward to, to what's possible there. Okay, now I need to have a little bit of sanity check. We, like how much time should I, can I talk about this? So this is a topic like mixed models and it is a topic that I think is super many people are excited about. Um, and uh, yeah, there's another really big benefit of going to Julia because um, in Julia, you, you, like using this kind of mixed models package in Julia is for some of the models, like I had a logistic regression, I tried it on, it was a factor of 100 faster than in R, and R is like the state of the art thing. And that's like factor two is already really nice. Uh, I would probably switch language for that. It's like waiting half an hour versus an hour or something like that, but factor 100 is like waiting a, a week versus waiting half an hour or something like that. I don't know if that's actually true. Let's, I should choose different examples, but that's, so it's really nice. And um, if you think of EEG, EEG and you have this mass univariate thing, then you need to fit many different uh, linear models in for each channel again. So you want to have something fast. <laughs> but fitting is only one thing. Yeah, that's maybe possible by waiting, but there are other more conceptual issues. For instance, there's statistics. How do you do statistics uh, if you have uh, linear mixed models in, in Julia, right? All the kind of problems that uh, crap creep up. I will talk about it in a second, like um, type one errors and permutation tests and, and the like. And then, of course, how do we validate all our approaches? Can we actually do that or not? So this is this is becoming an increasingly important part in my daily life, basically to just simulate much more than I used to. 
And I didn't simulate A because I didn't know, and B, I, there was no tools to do it. So I'm, I'm developing, actively developing tools to make simulations of this kind of analysis much easier. Okay, a little bit of intuition for why you should care about linear mixed models and what all the fuss is about. All the psycholinguistics have been doing it since 50 years, and now everybody tries to do it. Okay, imagine you're measuring something of uh, this this uh, uh, this population of, of people here, and each of this person gets like one value. It's like the mean response in a reaction time task or, or whatever. So you get this kind of population response. You're not actually interested in individuals. Everybody's a little bit different. You don't, you don't really care. You want to know what's an on average, what's the reaction time or however. And you can quantify this. Um, you have a mean, like a location parameter here. If you have some kind of uncertainty, standard error, I just use for, for brevity of this explanation, right? But then you notice, I hey, wait a moment. I have maybe something different, better. I have here, I took the mean reaction time, but I have each individual trial as well, right? So let's, maybe I could just do, uh, just take all of this data and calculate the same thing. And suddenly I notice, oh, this is great. My uncertainty is much smaller if I, if I don't first average over the subjects, and but I, I go for the for the whole data. So that's perfect, right? I, immediately I show you a method that can make all your p-values much smaller, or your standard uncertainty much smaller. So it's really good. But of course, that's completely wrong. You should never do that, right? This these values here, they are too small. They are not taking into account that each of these data points here is actually coming like has a, has like a, a, a hidden uh, um, uh, 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 dependence, right? So all of these data points here come from the same subject. So if I know one of those already, and I know that this is from that subject, and I know this one is also from the subject, I should not be surprised that it's close by to, to this one here, right? Um, and this is always a question of within and between subject variability, like how much is chitter is there here between the means and how much chitter is there within one subject, right? But this is really important, right? You should really always take into account that data come can come like they are clustered or they they are come from the can come from the same subject right and now that um, so what we uh, oh yeah and basically what's what's a little bit hidden underlying here is that uh, each of the subject also has this kind of distribution that you have on the, on the level where you're pulling um, trials out of each subject and the intermediate conclusion here is that data points from the same subject are more similar typically so you should model it Right. That's uh, either you average it and you lose lots of information, or you model it, and that's where linear mixed models come in. But that's a nice, very interesting thing. We, I could recolor these in a, in a, a different sensible way, something like this. And uh, now you can still see that some of the colors are close, closer by. Maybe there's a little bit more spread, but the blue ones are more here, the green ones are more here. And this, if I just copy this over here, and this this comes from that I show the same stimuli to the to the same to the same subjects. Now the, the whole intuition breaks down a little bit, but you could think of of the uh, of the stimuli here as subjects as well, and you have an uncertainty and a location parameter, etc. But it, it's a little bit hard to combine this with this. So what I'm more want to, to show you is that there can be other dependencies in the data that you should also model, right? So data points from the same items are more similar, and those you should also model it. And once you have this. Then it's really hard because you can't use the mean the means anymore because as soon as you take the mean one mean for each subject you're losing this information because uh, different items went into one subject potentially than the other etc. And that's the that's the that's the big deal and language is super important because the language of course they are not animals but they are different words and all different words has have different idiosyncrasies. Uh, one word you react faster than the other one but all everybody does so you have to take into account all of this variability. And that's when linear mixed models comes in. Okay, this is a big intuition, right? Lots of math, and if you want this, uh, uh, go in the background. But I don't have time for any of this. So the EG LMM awakens here. Um, instead of uh, fitting a, 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 a linear model, we are fitting here a linear mixed model. And for that, we have to concatenate all the data for all the subjects. We're using a mixed model. And of course, we're not only going to get this out, but we're also going to what we call random effects. These are kind of like modeling the variability of the subjects. So, um, uh, like, yeah, you can do this uh, in Unfold. It works quite nicely. It takes one second to fit uh, re relatively, real, uh, maybe a smallish uh, um, data set, but it's not super slow or, any, or anything like that. So, fitting each of these um, 
um, uh, time points here, you fit the linear mix model and you get out the fixed effect. That's what typically you're interested in. But you also get like, what's the variability here for item or what's the variability for subject and even maybe for the condition effects, right? So this would be the random slopes. This is simulated data. I have it somewhere, run it somewhere on, on uh, real data as well, but I, I don't think I included it in this talk here. And I also don't have time for it, of course. But if we can run it on simulated data, we get something like this. We can even calculate some kind of uh, p-values or so, and we get all this kind of um, significant values. But of course, we know if you run something like this, you should expect 5% of your uh, uh, samples should be false positives if you have independent data. So you will have lots of false positives here. How do we typically deal in EG with this? This is typically that we do some kind of cluster permutation tests. And I think, uh, yeah, I would just talk about it. It's better to have the, the, the basics. Is it better? Well, I don't know. You would just stop me at some point. Okay. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's a nice, uh, I did, um, Another of this uh, demos that you had for the effects, uh, uh, for the nonlinear effects, I did here for cluster permutation tests, or a student of mine did it here in that case, uh, Louis Lips. So check it out if you want the more, more details. But the, the, the central idea of cluster permutation tests works like that. You have two conditions, A and B, and you have a difference of condition A minus B. So this is paired data in that case, but it doesn't really matter. What you're going to do is you calculate your statistics here. So T value, for instance, you put in a threshold and you see like you're not looking at a single time point here, but you're looking at a cluster. Everything that's above threshold, this is one cluster, and you save how large is the sum values of all t values here. So how large is the cluster? We call it the cluster mass as well. What you're then going to do is you're going to shuffle your conditions, right? So you just switch them, and uh, you calculate the difference again. You get another t value. Now, typically, this should be smaller, let's hope, uh, but sometimes just by... Uh, by randomness, you will also get a cluster, right? So maybe this cluster is a little bit smaller, and you save this cluster here as another cluster value. And now you're going to repeat this process, and you will get another value, and another value, another value. But all of these values that you're calculating here, they are under the assumption that there's no, like, like that we can just shuffle these two conditions so that there's no difference between the conditions, right? And this gives you the observed cluster mass. Oh, sorry for the mess here. Basically, it gives you a distribution of what should I expect for a cluster mass is if the two conditions are shuffled. And then I can look up, hey, what is my actual observed cluster mass? Is it somewhere in here? So should I expect if I just shuffle the clusters uh, to see something like that? Or is this actually uh, extremely unlikely that I see a value as large as that or larger? And that's exactly what you what you would do in, in a cluster permutation test. This was now super fast, so I hope uh, it helped a little bit, but please re read this more extensive, uh, if you're interested in that extensive tutorial kind of interactive demo, uh, if you're more interested in that. But we need this for the LMMs, because this is exactly what we want, want to do. We would want to run the LMMs, and then we want to permute them somehow, and then we want to run a cluster a cluster test on it somehow, right? That's a permutation test, right? How do we permute LMMs? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we can... Uh, we, we literally don't know. We came up with a way together with um, uh, Jaromir Frossard and uh, Olivier Renault and Philip Alday. Um, we came up with, with one way that could potentially work. And it's now still up to me to uh, do all the simulations for it. It takes a long time. Uh, you need to run many, many uh, simulations. So this is a little bit convoluted and it's uh, like a sneak peek because not all simulations have finished actually yet. What are you seeing here? Oh, uh, should I explain first what we do? Now, let's first show you that it works, and then I'm going to explain why it works or how it works. So in this very complicated plot here, because I had it available, sorry, uh, we have here on the x-axis, we have number of items, per, so number of trials, basically. Here we have four or 10 or 30 subjects in this facets here, but we can just look at, let's say, this one here. It looks the cleanest, right? And we have several different colors, like green is uh, bootstrapping, uh, uh, blue is like a waltz t test. Um, orange is the likelihood ratio test. So these are all different ways that you can do statistics. And we invented or like proposed or whatever uh, to do some kind of permutation test. And you want, if you have no effect in the data, as in all of the simulations, you want to have the type one error at five percent of simulations. You want to have a significant effect, even though there's none. And as you can see, our um, tool, of course, uh, works best. But it also, of course, uh, because the, the most commonly used one, the Kenwood, Kenwood Rogers, I still have some kind of implementation issue with it. It's always tells me there's nothing significant. 
So um, yeah, it's a little bit weird. So take it with a grain of salt here. And uh, uh, yeah. It turns out so we have now a way in Julia to permute it. It's super slow. Uh, so it takes like 300 seconds to do um, 500 permutations. Um, kind of makes sense. You took one second to fit the model before. So you do it 500 times. But it's it's still in a ballpark where you can actually do it, right? It's it's not it's not completely insane. Uh, so what are we actually doing is this is a, this is now for people who are a little bit more familiar, of course. This is the typical formula of a mixed model. So you have the fixed effects with the sign matrix, and this is where the random effects uh, live in. So this is where, where the subject information comes in, right? So what we, what are we permuting? We, we need to permute two things. We need to um, we need to like we are generating new data basically that we then fit again with our model, and we are setting this um, uh, beta that we are uh, interested in. We are setting that to zero, so we are not including any of the effects. And then at the same time, we are permuting the subject. So each subject has like a, you can estimate what's the effect of one subject. And we just flip that at around zero because nicely all of these effects will always be uh, around zero. So we can just flip them in a smart way. And uh, we also have to permute the residual. So what's left over after you take care that all the subjects uh, dependencies have been taken care. So we need to permute the two things. And if we do then, we get like a, a permuted data and we can again run our linear mix model and extract whatever statistics we want from the linear mix model, let's say the waltz to T or something like that. Uh, and, and that's exactly how it works. And it seems to work, right? Uh, so that's that's super nice. And um, yeah, then we are only missing one thing, uh, the cluster permutation. In principle, you're already, like we already, uh, uh, finish because we could just use the boring old cluster mass uh, thing, but there's a, a really cool, nicer, uh, faster, um, a better method called cluster depth that I wanted to talk about, but I feel like I'm stretching the time limit uh, uh, quite a bit already. I'm not sure how we should proceed with this. Um, let's let me, I will finish with the whole talk and then we we'll see whether I uh, whether we dive in here. But just as an advertisement, this is much faster. It has more or less strong uh, family-wise error uh, correction, uh, error rate here, uh, which is not true for TFCE or cluster math. It's much faster than TFCE, uh, similarly fast to cluster math, I, mass, I guess I didn't benchmark it, and but it has more power. So if there's an effect, it will show rather an effect. And it's, it's very clever and I really like it. Uh, but unfortunately, the cluster threshold is back compared to TFCE. Okay, lots of details. I don't want to... Like this was, I had prepared some kind of uh, visualization of how this actually works, but I don't have time for it. If we apply it here, uh, all of the other random effects, they drop away and only our uh, p-values here remain. And we have corrected p-values now for that simulated effect. Okay, um, finally, I just want to have a small advertisement. We are currently running an EG visualization survey together with Vladimir Mikhev uh, in, my, in, in our lab here. If you haven't filled this out, please, Go to this website. You can win one of three EG headbands. So if you're interested in EG, it's easy. And you don't need to be an expert. We especially uh, target novices uh, in visualization as well. So if you ever plotted an EG figure or so, you are uh, uh, very invited to fill out this, um, this survey here. And of course, share it with all your friends and all your courses and, and, and whatnot. So, so that they also, because you can win three headbands, so maybe other people can win one too, right? Not only you. And with that, uh, yeah, eg minus survey dot s minus ccs dot de. Uh, I will put it in the chat in a second as well. Uh, with that, yeah, thank you for your attention.